Most storytellers excel at only one form. Rare is the polymath. French writer Marguerite Duras was such an exception. Her brief novel from the 1980s, The Lover, was an international bestseller as well as literary prize winner. Her script for the 1959 film Hiroshima Mon Amour, directed by Alain René, helped define modernism in the movies. Her biographer, Jean Vallier, tells Canapé about the woman and her art. Marguerite Duras was f foremost a French writer known for a sense of style, I believe, that probably a little bit of the equivalent of a French Virginia Woolf, if you like. You know, she was uh, very uh, keen on changing uh, something in literature that people like Nathalie Sarot and Le Rougrier uh, wanted to do also. She was never part of the Nouveau Roman, she was never part of a school, but uh, she was very much attuned to having to change the psychology of the French novel uh, or the absence of it, if you like. And then on her own style, uh, when you go from her first book to La Mans, which ma made her famous in 1984, uh, it was a sort of a simplification of uh, the syntax and everything. You know, she worked extremely hard, and she did the same thing in movies, because what we should uh, say right away about her, she was not only a very good writer, but she was also a very interesting filmmaker. From 69 on, she was also seen as a representative of what she called cinema différent, if you like so. She could be uh, invited everywhere. She came to New York several times at the New York Film Festival. I met her at the New York Film Festival in 1969. Richard Hard, one of the founders of the festival, was my friend, so he said, I'm showing this movie by Marguerite Duras. I had a film society in New York, the Cine Club at the Alliance Francaise. So I said, uh, he said, do you want to meet Marguerite Duras? Yes, of course I want to meet her. So after the, the projection of Destroy, she said, uh, I met her and she said, well, let's go have a coffee. So an hour and a half later, we're still talking. So she started saying, well, you know, cinema really concerns you. So we, we started writing to each other. I helped her uh, having uh, La Musica, our first movie, subtitled, things like this. And little by little, we became close friends. Uh, I would visit her in Paris or in her country house. When she came to New York, she'd stay with me a couple of times. She was a very easy person to uh, go with. We never talked literature. We talked mostly theater and, and film, so it may have helped also. I was never uh, an adorateur, if you like, <laughs> which saved me from uh, <laughs> disgrace, uh, literally. But uh, that lasted f until her death, practically. and. Um, when she died, I was in New York. Uh, I could not go uh, to the funerals uh, because I was busy in New York and I was bothered by that. So I started reading uh, maybe uh, as a sort of a fair monde, as they say in French. I started reading about her and I realized, you know, this is not the Marguerite Duras I knew. They were like already 175 and no 200 theses. PhD and otherwise on Marguerite Duras in uh, half of them in the United States. And most of it was, uh, you know, outside of a, a person. First of all, based on uh, things that nobody had researched. Because she fantasized about her life. She mythologized her life. You know, she lied, if you like. But, you know, writers are like this. Chateaubriand did much worse, and, and Sartre probably also. But anyway, so I decided, well, I wanted to write. I'd retired, and I thought, uh, I have to do something. So I started the idea of a biography, and I didn't know really where I was going. I didn't know if I would be up to the task. So I started to very uh, imperiously to start st set the record straight, as I said, which was uh, probably cheeky. But uh, you know, with time, if you, if you apply yourself, you can really. And then I started rereading uh, little by little. Uh, Everything she had written, I started seeing her movies again. Many plays I had helped promote in New York. So I knew the work, but I had to re reintroduce myself to it. Hiroshima. Someone wanted to do a movie with French people, French uh, directors, uh, about the atomic bomb. So René was uh, 
the choice uh, director because he had done night and fog and everybody thought when you know if someone could treat the problem of the atomic bomb probably uh, René could address that and René uh, was non-committal until he decided to try to find a writer who could uh, uh, make something uh, so the two of them met finally uh, and decided that it was impossible to do the kind of documentary he had done, like Night and Fog, on the atomic bomb. So would Marguerite write something about it? So she went to St. Tropez, where she <laughs> spent the summer and said, after six weeks, I said, no, 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 I can't do it. René persisted. He was, you know, very clever. And she said, well, try again, you know. And then she came up with the idea of having a love story on the background of the aftermath of the atomic bomb, which is the subject of uh, Hiroshima Mon Amour. La nuit, ça ne s'arrête jamais à Hiroshima. Jamais ça ne s'arrête à Hiroshima. Je t'oublie déjà, regarde comme je t'oublie, regarde-moi about um, the, the, the lover and these works that de, uh, de, de Ras wrote that are, uh, if not directly autobiographical, nonetheless based in her experience as someone who spent part of her youth uh, in what was then French sure. in Indochina. Well, that's a very important element, fundamental in the work, all the work of Marguerite Duras. She was born in Saigon, near Saigon, in 1914. She came to Paris once in 1932. So, uh, no, she came before, uh, after her father died for two years in the 20s, but she was only eight years old. So that left uh, some uh, impressions, but not deep inside. She was a, a Vietnamese, basically. She claimed herself all her life, you know. Uh, when I was young, I, I would uh, exaggerate. I would go uh, barefoot uh, everywhere in the jungle, and uh, I spoke Vietnamese as well as, as French better, and so on, which is partly true. But w w what was really very important, and it's very important for the reader of, the, of Lamont, the, the lover, she grew up uh, a consciousness of the world, uh, the, of the light, of uh, the river. You know, she grew up by the Mekong River. So in her work, water and the Mekong and this whole atmosphere is very important. I believe it's common uh, stock for great writers to you know, go back to their uh, early experiences. But in her case, it goes beyond just, uh, it was never decorative, it was never exoticism. It was, again, something that she personally felt very deeply, including a sort of compassion for what she saw, the poverty, the, the lepers, uh, things like this. Uh, and visually, uh, she had this wonderful uh, stock of images that she had been uh, growing up with. She went to Hanoi, she went to Saigon, she was in Phnom Penh with her family. So she had a very wide experience of, which was no, uh, as you know, Vietnam was no Indochina. Um, and beyond any criticism that she may have had over the colonial, colonial past, uh, it was more personal again. It was what any great writer like Conrad, let's say, has experienced at sea or whatever and can regurgitate during a lifetime uh, working in various media.
French accordionist, Richard Galliano, grew up listening to Duke Ellington, John Coltrane, and other figures of American jazz. This influence is clear in his album, New York Tango. He keeps finding new arenas for the sound of the accordion. Recent projects range from Vivaldi to Brazilian pop. Canapé stops by a gig at the Jazz Standard in New York to talk about his passion for his instrument. La première fois que je suis venu, maintenant il y a une vingtaine d'années, lorsque j'ai enregistré l'album New York Tango, justement avec George Braz, pour moi c'était vraiment un choc et c'était le rêve américain, le rêve de New York, le rêve. Je dis pas aujourd'hui. Disons que je voyage beaucoup et j'ai beaucoup de plaisir à venir à New York, mais ça me fait plus le même effet. Je suis plus autant impressionné. Donc ça me permet de jouer différemment. Ce soir, j'ai joué comme je joue de partout ailleurs. Et puis en essayant de jouer des choses un peu plus de, de ma terre, c'est-à-dire j'ai joué des valses musettes, j'ai joué des morceaux de Francis Lay, vraiment français, parce que je pense que le public ici est très ouvert et Et il a, il a envie qu'on leur, on, qu'on lui apporte des, des, des cho- choses non pas nouvelles, mais des choses un peu exotiques, quoi. Et Paris, c'est, je pense que Paris pour New York, c'est exotique. important pour moi là, quand je parle de la terre c'est par rapport à bien sûr au souvenir d'enfance euh, le, le midi de la France la, la lavande le soleil euh, la Méditerranée euh, euh, tout ça mais euh, aussi euh, comment dire euh, au plus je voyage je voyage vraiment énormément et au plus j'ai envie de retourner j'ai retour, de retourner euh, euh, près de ma terre pour me me ressourcer me reprendre de l'énergie euh, Euh, et, et voilà, et, et disons que tout, tout cela est, co- est complémentaire. Le fait de venir à New York, euh, ça me donne du recul par rapport à, 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 à mon environnement euh, de chez moi, de la région de Nice, que j'apprécie encore plus. Et, et, et inversement, lorsque je suis à Nice, je rêve de New York, vous voyez. Euh, ce sont des, des rêves qui alimentent ma, mon inspiration pour la musique en général. Voilà.
Je pense que l'accordéon a été très populaire dans les années 40-50 ici, en Amérique. D'ailleurs, moi, toutes mes idoles accordonistes sont des accordonistes de jazz américain. Euh, Art Van Damme, Ernie Felice, qui est toujours en vie aujourd'hui et qui, a, qui habite Los Angeles, qui joue avec Benny Goodman. Pour moi, c'est vraiment mon héros. Euh, et donc... <rire> Thank you. Merci, thank you. Et euh, comment dire, euh, je pense que les modes sont cycliques, alors euh, là le fait de revenir et de jouer, je pense, j'ai l'impression à voir les réactions des gens, euh, que, que c'est quelque chose qui les étonne, qui redécouvre comme si c'était quelque chose de nouveau, alors que c'est simplement le phénomène d'un cycle. Euh, je, je disais dans les années 40, beaucoup d'Américains jouaient l'accordéon, puis après ça a disparu avec les synthétiseurs, tout ça. Et aujourd'hui, peut-être si grâce à moi, ça peut revenir un peu, si le, le public euh, peut être sensible à cet instrument, euh, pour moi, c'est mission accomplie. Quoi. <rire> In April 2014, Art Squared offered New Yorkers a visual arts festival. Among the participants was Castillo Corrales, a collectively run independent art space in Paris that comprises a bookshop, Section 7 Books, and a publishing house, Paraguay Press. Benjamin Torel is a member of the collective. He talks to Canapé about the intersections of art and activism. The project Art Space came out of the invitation of creator Phil Mead who's uh, doing a project uh, in the framework of uh, Art Square. He knew the show Issues of All Time in Paris. He was interested in the work of some of the artists. So there was this ongoing conversation. We knew also well Artist Space. It's been kind of, uh, well, reference also for the way we've been uh, thinking. For the time we've been doing just Cedar Corrales and the bookstore section, seven books, and the press, which is called Pedego Press. We've been working with kind of a really uh, amazing and stimulating international network of small publishers, some like being small institutions, some being independent structure, 
run by artists. A very important thing then for us was also, for example, with the space, the model as a, of the bookstore as indeed a social space, meaning starting to sell books and to publish books meant uh, that it's, you can like then invite people for reading, invite people for a uh, conversation about this uh, question. You can work uh, in developing like uh, a public, working on the social dimension. We've been doing this for seven years. We keep on having to invent and reinvent the basis on which we're working, the kind of common creed, um, this economy. It's always like pretty fragile, but it's always like fun to do it together. It's always like uh, implies lots of energy in a good sense in terms of like, I don't know, um, also involving different people in the project little by little. always like to figure out how we um, kind of uh, work together in this kind of horizontal level which is like nobody's uh, head of the studio we like all directors um, so which implies also lots of energy but also this kind of way of understanding each other's like um, uh, time uh, energy that can be put in the in the different project because of strength of the collective is also to have like a, this like kind of uh, open time frame that we can like negotiate by ourselves. What is this? What is that? What is that? What do you like? This is not a totally predictable time. Uh, so some of the artists came up a little bit before to kind of uh, hey, to kind of create the environment. Um, we um, invite some people with the idea that there was this kind of possibility to that a meet, meeting and a counter happens at that moment, not in terms of, uh, well, that it would be the magic thing, but in terms of, well, that's how it can happen. Thank you. 
Thank <laughs> you. 